chapter four of the forbidden way by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva the forbidden way he came forward and stood facing her one hand clutching the back of a chair his eyes blazing with newly kindled resentment yes i will tell you it's right for you to know there was a man in my employ who had a fancied grievance against my foreman he had no just cause for complaint i found that out and told harbison to fire him if harbison had obeyed orders there would have been a different story to tell about the lone tree but my foreman took pity on him because he had a family then tried to get him started right again the man used to work extra time at night sometimes with a shift and sometimes alone and one night in the small gallery at the hundred foot level he found the vein we had been looking for he was a german max reimer by name max reimer she repeated mechanically alone there in that cavern he thought out the plan which afterward resulted in putting me out of business he quickly got some timbers together and hid the hole he'd made this was easy for the steps and railing of the wince needed supports and planking he put in a blast farther over and hid the gold-bearing rock all but a few of the pieces these he took out in the pockets of his overalls and carried them to jeff ray jeff your husband called in pete mulrennan and they talked it over then one night pete and max crept up to the mine got past the watchman and max showed pete what he'd found i learned all this from harbison after they let max loose let him loose what do you mean i'll tell you max wanted a lump sum in cash they laughed at him chiefly because they didn't have the money to pay then he wanted a percentage bigger than they wanted to give when they temporized he got ugly swore he'd rather run his chances with harbison and me but he never had an opportunity you don't mean she gasped ray and mulrennan lured reimer to a room over the saloon and got up a fight they put him out gagged and trussed him like a fowl and left him there until jeff ray had closed the deal with me that's how your husband got my mine it can't be she stammered yes yes and reimer they hid him for two weeks until they brought to terms i remember she said passing her hand over her brow reimer's boy was in my school they missed old max they thought he had deserted them what a horrible thing and jeff my husband that is what people call jeff ray's luck he said and then added grimly and my misfortune but the law she said was there no way in which you could prove the 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 fraud he said brutally oh yes the law do you know who impersonates the law in mesa city pete mulrennan he's judge court and jury we had the best lawyer in denver but lawrence berkeley had done his work too well there's a suit still pending but we haven't a show good god camilla do you mean to say you heard nothing of all this nothing she said nothing when i heard of the suit and questioned jeff he he said it was maliciousness jealousy disappointment and i believed him he turned away from her and paced the floor he was right it was all of these but there was something else oh i know she broke in it was what i am feeling now the sense of a wrong but you forget she got up and faced him groping vaguely for an extenuating circumstance that sort of thing has been done in the west before a successful mine is all a matter of luck max reimer's find might have only been a pocket in that case you would have been the gainer and jeff would have lost that's sophistry i can't blame you for defending your husband mines have been leased and bought on theory with a chance to win a chance to lose for the mere love of a gamble there was no gamble here 
the gold ore was there one had only to look there never has been anything like it since cripple creek it was mine jeff ray wanted it so he took it by force she had sunk on the settee between the windows her face buried in her hands and was trying to think all this the hired magnificence the empty show the damask she was sitting on the rings on her hands her clothing even belonged by every law of decency and morality to the man who stood there before her and the wrong she had so long cherished in her heart against him was as nothing to the injury her husband had done to him she knew nothing of the law cared nothing for it all she could think of were the facts of the case as he had presented them cortland told the truth she recognized it in everything he had said in the ringing note of his voice the clear light of his eye the resentment of a nature that had been tried too far a hundred forgotten incidents were now remembered jeff's reticence about the lawsuit max reimer's disappearance the many secret conferences with mulrennan she wondered that suspicion of jeff had never entered her mind before she realized now more poignantly than ever that she had been moving blindly supinely under the spell of a personality stronger than her own she recalled the scene in the canyon when beside herself with shame and mortification she had struck him in the face and he had only laughed at her as he would have laughed at a rebellious child in that moment she had hated him the tolerance that had come later had been defensive a defense of her pride when cortland bent had left she had flown like a wounded swallow to the hawk's nest glad of any refuge from the ache at her heart she raised her head and sought bent's eyes with her own a while ago it had seemed so easy to speak to him he had been so gentle with her and his reticence had made her own indifference possible he had gone back to the dead fire again as though to find there a phoenix of his lost hope and was leaning with an elbow on the mantel his head bowed in subjection he had put his fetters on again as though to make her understand that his sharp indictment of her husband had not been intended to include the woman he loved painfully she rose and took a step toward him and when she spoke her voice was low and constrained for her thoughts came with difficulty you are right there is a moral code a law of conscience in my heart i know that no matter what other men have done in the west in their madness for gold the fever for wealth nothing the law holds will make jeff's responsibility to you any the less in my sight i-i did not know you believe me don't you i did not know even if i had known perhaps it would not have made any difference but i am sure of one thing i could never have married a man to live on what he had stolen from another as he turned toward her she put her hands over her face oh i am shamed shamed perhaps i could have done something i would have tried you know that i would have tried don't you yes yes i know i would not have told i would not have made you unhappy but it maddens me to see you here with what is mine his wife he took her hands down and made her look in his face don't think harshly of me it isn't the money if you could have had it if you didn't have to share it with him can't you understand but she would not look at him and only murmured i understand i understand many things i did not know before but the one thing that seems most important is that i am his wife whatever he has done to others he has been very good very gentle and kind to me he dropped her hands and turned violently away how could you he groaned how could you have married him 
god knows the words were wrung from her quickly like the sudden dropping of a burden which shocked by the noise of its impact before she was conscious of its loss she turned in the same moment and looked at him hoping that he had not heard her but before she could prevent him he had caught her in his arms and held her close to his body so that struggle as she might there was no chance for her to escape and in his eyes she saw the gleam of an old delight a bright wild spark among the embers of bitterness camilla he whispered i know now god forgive me that i did not know before out there in the schoolhouse when you gave yourself to him you loved me then you love me now isn't that why you tremble camilla you need not speak your heart is close to mine i can read no 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 she murmured it is not true you must not i did not mean what i said you misunderstood once i misunderstood i won't make the same mistake again it was i who found you there parching in the desert and taught you how to grow who showed you that life was something more than the barren waste you had found it won't you forgive me i was a fool and worse look up at me camilla dear you were mine out there before you were his at least a half of what jeffrey has stolen from me your spiritual side at the sound of her husband's name she raised her head and looked up at him in a daze he caught her again madly and his lips even brushed her cheek but she started from his arms and sped the length of the room away from him camilla no no you must not she stood facing him wildly pleading don't come near me court is this the way you are going to try to forget the way you will teach me to forget i didn't know then i want you camilla as he came forward she retreated to the door of the library and put her hand on the knob she did not hear the soft patter of feet on the other side then i must go she said decisively he stopped looked at her blankly then turned away i suppose you're right he said quietly forgive me i had almost forgotten he slowly paced the room away from her and his head in his hands sank in a distant chair he heard her sharp sigh and the sound of her footsteps as she gathered courage and came forward but he did not move and listened with the dull ears of a broken man from whom all hope has departed it is going to be harder than i thought i hoped at least that i could keep what was in my heart a secret when my secret was my own it did not seem as if i was doing any injustice to to jeff it was my heart that was breaking not his what did my secrets matter as long as i did my duty but now that you share the burden i know that i am doing him a great wrong a greater wrong even than he has done to you i can't blame you for coming here it is hard to forgive a wrong like that but with me it is different no matter what jeff has done what he may do my duty is very clear my duty to him and even to you i don't know just how i must have time to think it out for myself one thing is certain i must not see you again he waved a hand in deprecation that is so easy to say you shall see me again he threatened i will not give you up you must i will find some excuse to leave new york i'll follow you doggedly you're mine she paused in dismay were all the odds to be against her a sudden terror gripped her heart and left her supine she summoned her strength with an effort court she cried desperately you must not speak to me like that i will not listen you don't know what you are saying i don't care what i'm saying you have driven me mad as he rose she retreated still facing him her lips pale her eyes bright her face drawn but resolved and i she said clearly i am sane again if you follow i will ring do you hear 
her hand sought the wall then was arrested in mid-air a sound of voices the ringing of a bell and the soft patter of a servant's steps in the corridor brought cortland bent to his senses it's jeff she whispered breathlessly and then with a quiet air of self-command the dignity of a well-bred hostess will you sit down mr bent i will ring for tea in the shadowed doorway a tall figure stood why jeff said camilla coolly you're early aren't you i thought she rose as she realized that the gentleman in the doorway wore a frock coat a garment jeff affected to despise and that the hair at his temples was white i beg your pardon she murmured the gentleman smiled and came forward into the room with outstretched hand i am general bent is this mrs ray your husband is coming along jeff entered from the corridor at this moment hello camilla the general was kind enough to say he wanted to meet you so he brought me uptown in his machine the eyes of both newcomers fell on cortland bent who emerged from the shadow why court you here said the general and if his quick tones showed slight annoyance his well-bred accents meant only polite inquiry yes dad how do you do mr ray ray went over and took him by the hand well well said ray heartily this is sure like old times glad to see you bent it seems like only yesterday that you and camilla were galloping over the plains together a year and a half has made some changes eh camilla can't we have a drink one doesn't meet old friends every day i rang for tea tea Ugh! not tea camilla i can't get used to these foreign notions general court some scotch that's better tea was invented for sick people and old maids and then as the servant entered tell greer to bring the tray and some cigars you'll let us won't you camilla general bent and i have been talking for two hours and if there's any thirstier business than that i hope we aren't intruding said the general i have been very anxious to meet you mrs ray i'm very much flattered i'm afraid though that jeff has taken you out of your way she paused conscious that the sharp eyes of the old man were peering at her curiously from under the shadows of his bushy eyebrows i feel as if i ought to know you very well she went on in the west your son often spoke of you did he hm. and then with a laugh cortland my boy what did you say to her you expected to see an old ogre didn't you oh no but you are different from the idea i had of you you and your son are not in the least alike are you no you see cortland took the comeliness of the davages and i well i won't tell you what they call me in the street he laughed grimly you know mr ray and i have some interests in the west in common some properties that adjoin and some railroads that join it's absurdly simple he wants what i have and i want what he has and neither of us is willing to give up a square inch won't you tell us what to do i give it up she laughed my husband has a way of getting what he wants the great secret of that said ray comfortably is wanting what you can get still i don't doubt that when the general's crowd gets through with me there won't be enough of me to want anything you needn't worry about the lone tree cortland you'll have it again after a while when my hide is spread out to dry general bent's eyes vanished under his heavy brows no he said cryptically it looks as though the fruit of the lone tree was forbidden End of chapter 4